Well, hi, everyone. Well, you can't escape the near constant barrage of negative news about Boeing. And I wanted to look at what's going on with them from a global engineering perspective, as it were. I mean, Boeing is arguably the most important American company involved with manufacturing and selling products, not only throughout North America, but all over the world. They have annual revenue of around $78 billion, a market capitalization of $122 billion, and they are mired in one major problem after the other, and have been in particular going back the last five years. So what I was curious about is how did one of the greatest engineering companies in the world fall on such hard times? And in particular, I wanted to examine the question of whether major engineering companies need to be run by engineers instead of accountants, CPAs, MBAs, that sort of thing. So I want to go through the history of key managers, key CEOs going back the last 25 years at Boeing, highlight some of the key issues that they have, and just relate my own experience, what it's like to work for major engineering companies and uh, contrast people that I've seen that were more business oriented versus those that were more engineering oriented. And uh, jumping ahead of the, this, the plan here a little bit, I think Boeing needs to be led much more extensively by highly experienced, high integrity engineers to have any hope of recovering their reputation and position in the marketplace. So let's just go through a few of the recent headlines. There's a photo here that shows the aftermath of some of the passengers being injured when a Boeing 787 plunged mid-flight uh, at a rapid rate of descent. That uh, episode is currently being investigated. Then, of course, going back to the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, where you had two major crashes that involved a total of 346 fatalities with the Boeing 737 MAX. And uh, as it turned out, if you followed the story, it had to do with a faulty angle of attack sensor and how the software was handling the readings from that erroneous uh, or faulty piece of equipment. And uh, essentially the program was trying to avoid a stall of the aircraft when one wasn't actually occurring by forcing the nose downward. And uh, this led to the two major and fatal crashes in 2018 and 2019. As it turns out through subsequent investigations, Boeing was trying to avoid issuing a, a million dollar rebate per aircraft for the 737 MAX because if uh, additional flight simulator training was needed because of the software and the configuration of the aircraft, they were trying to create incentive for people to, to buy these aircraft. And they went to great lengths to avoid FAA scrutiny about whether this program even exists, what it, what it did, how it operated. And of course, they handled it very poorly uh, from, from Boeing standpoint. As a result, they ended up settling with the federal government and paid out $2.5 billion. Then we have the news of the whistleblower earlier this week uh, who passed away in South Carolina. He alleged many manufacturing problems with a Boeing plant in South Carolina. You have people becoming more and more aware of what type of aircraft they're flying on, and, and a lot of people are avoiding flying on 737 MAXs. You know, after those two crashes in 2018 and 2019, the, the other countries quickly grounded the 737 MAX. It took the FAA some amount of time, and they eventually grounded the 737 MAX for 20 months. Also in the news this week, uh, there was a story about how the FAA found many problems with their audit of Boeing's 737 MAX production program. And of course, we had the January 5th Alaska Airlines incident where a door plug blew out of a 737 MAX. And fortunately, nobody was uh, seriously injured, but somebody could have easily been sucked out of the fuselage or if that plane had been at 30,000 feet instead of 16,000 feet, uh, the crew, passengers all could have lost consciousness. It, it's, 
And, and subsequent investigations uh, discovered that the anchor bolts were missing to secure this door plug into the fuselage. So again, supply chain issues, production issues, and it turns out Boeing hasn't been able to lay their hands on the installation records for that particular door plug in terms of who actually did it. Uh, surveillance video apparently was overwritten uh, inadvertently, or I, I'm not suggesting there was a cover up, but it's just almost a comedy of errors with Boeing right now. So Boeing has four main divisions and all the problems we're talking about right now are with their commercial airplane division, BCA. You also have Boeing Defense, Space and Security, Boeing Global Services, and Boeing Capital. Now I came across this Harvard article about how Boeing got into trouble with these types of issues. And they indicate it's a combination of a failure of leadership as well as a negative change in company culture. And they really attribute the downhill slide at Boeing to leadership starting with Philip Condit. He was CEO from 1997 to 2005. He resigned under uh, ethics cloud. He was responsible for moving Boeing's headquarters from Seattle to Chicago to secure about $60 million in tax incentives. Uh, this Harvard article mentioned that organically, Boeing had no connection with the Chicago area and it just removed their management that much farther away from their engineering and production operations in the Pacific Northwest. The other thing Condit did was he spearheaded the acquisition of McDonnell Douglas in 1997. And culturally, McDonnell Douglas operated in a very different fashion than Boeing at the time, where they were known to revamp air platforms instead of investing in designing and developing new platforms. Uh, very cost conscious, budget cutting type of organization. And uh, this Harvard article indicated that that had a negative impact on the overall safety and engineering culture at Boeing that had existed up until that acquisition in 1997. But uh, Philip Condit was an aeronautical engineer and then he was succeeded by Harry Stonecipher, who was CEO from 2003 to 2005. He had a degree in physics. He worked at General Motors, and it stated that he was highly influenced by the management style of Jack Welsh of General Electric fame. Then you have James McNerney, CEO from 2005 to 2015. He oversaw the development of the 737 MAX. His uh, degree was a uh, master's in business administration. Then you had Dennis Mullenberg, who was CEO from 2015 to 2019. He was an aerospace engineer. He simply didn't survive the uh, fallout from the 737 MAX crashes in 2018 and 2019. So he was ousted. And then the current CEO is uh, David Calhoun. He's CEO from January 2020 to the present. He went to work out of college at General Electric and his degree is in accounting. Now I wanna go back to this quote by uh, Harry Stonecipher. After Condit resigned in 2003 following an ethics scandal, Boeing's board convinced former McDonnell Douglas executive, Harry Stonecipher, to come out of retirement to replace Condit. Stonecipher, a General Electric alum, immediately set out to change Boeing's culture, proclaiming, when people say I changed the culture of Boeing, that was the intent so that it is run like a business rather than a great engineering firm. Now, do you think they would like to have a do-over on that one? You know, they made all these decisions to save money. Uh, their, their market capitalization has suffered greatly. Their stock's down significantly so far this year. It's down over 26% in the past six months. So you can see from the overview of, of past CEOs, there's a mix of uh, leaders f with engineering degrees as well as non-engineering degrees. So, you know, in my own experience, I've much preferred working at companies where senior management were in fact engineers if, if I was working for an engineering company. In fact, uh, I had an opportunity to go work for a national company in Chicago and the office leader was a non-engineer and uh, not out of sense of snobbery or anything like that. I just th thought that that probably wasn't a good situation. That there are times when, well, you know, taking a step back, 
one of the revelations that most people who graduate with an engineering degree and enter the workforce have is that, hey, wait a minute, this is actually a business. This isn't a matter of me coming up with the best engineering solution to a problem. You know, and engineers typically make great leaders, or they can, because they're good at problem solving, they're good at collaboration, they're good at working with not having enough information, that you never know everything you need to know about a situation. But over time, engineers who go from the technical side of things and move into management and even get their MBAs, they're at risk of becoming just another bean counter. And there are times in engineering where you have to put your company's products, your customer's well-being ahead of any consideration of, of profit, or profitability. Um, I've had several episodes in my own professional career where we were involved with the design involving some public safety aspect of a highway project. And at the last minute, the client, the DOT, was nervous that the contractor uh, bids for this repair work were going to be in excess of their budget. So they wanted to fundamentally reduce the effectiveness of the repair work that was going to be done, thinking that, oh, we'll have time to fix it if there's a failure. Well, I said, well, no, absolutely, there's, there's no time to fix stuff. These, these failures can progress in a matter of minutes or hours. It could happen at 2 in the morning, and the roadway's compromised before anybody finds out about it at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I basically wrote a strongly worded email saying, no, no, you don't. We're, we're not changing anything. And if you persist, I'm going to file a complaint with the state engineering board. Now, that got us kicked off the job. And uh, I remember my boss, who was a degreed engineer but was not really a practicing engineer. He, he owned the business. He was not at all happy with me. And I remember thinking at the time, where's his indignation as an engineer that the client would try and pull something that would jeopardize the safety of the public? I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. It's like, no, you're not going to do that. We're going to insist on what's, what's right for our stakeholders or our clients, even if the client doesn't appreciate it, and, and the general public. And you look at the situation with Boeing, and it's like, how could they not see that focusing on short-term profit over and over again would get them mired in essentially it could lead to an existential threat to Boeing. You know, Boeing, I hate the term too big to fail, but in terms of U.S. interests, they are too big to fail. And uh, so far, the board of directors hasn't shown much inclination to clean house with the, the C-suite. And uh, I think it's, it's going to come to a head here because it would seem that an outside group of leaders needs to be brought in that puts safety and appropriate manufacturing and tracking and supply chain management at the fore of getting this company uh, s s straightened out. And, you know, going back through trying to answer the question, well, would Boeing be better off being run by an engineer? Probably, but that doesn't guarantee that's going to solve the problems because as we've seen, They've had engineers in the CEO position in the past that made essentially disastrous decisions that have precipitated the current problems at Boeing. And so what is the common denominator with this Boeing leadership? Surprisingly, it's a General Electric connection. You know, any of you who've been around for any length of time, remember how lauded Jack Welsh of General Electric was. I mean, he was supposedly be the, the best business guru that ever existed. He was uh, CEO of General Electric from 1981 to 2001. In the first half of the 80s, he fired over 112,000 people. He was famous for firing 10% of their staff each and every year because his view was you always had the bottom 10% and they needed to go. Well, after, after Jack Welsh left, you know, General Electric became a shell of their former self. I mean, their valuation is significantly lower. They've lost many divisions that they previously held under Jack Welsh. And I think his entire management style has largely been discredited, at least by academia, 
But unfortunately, it's been modeled by many, many people, including executives at Boeing. Again, there's the current CEO Calhoun came from GE. You've got the Stone Cipher who basically said, hey, let's just treat Boeing like a business, forget about our engineering excellence. Another, another GE guy. So, I mean, obviously I don't have all the answers to Boeing's problems, but I think having key engineers involved, outside engineers brought in to change the company culture is absolutely paramount. But uh, again, this notion that Jack Welsh had figured out how corporate America should run uh, has led to a lot of problems with people emulating his management style, in my opinion. You know, one of the things that Jack Welsh popularized was driving short-term profit to generate enough cash for these companies to buy back their stock. Boeing's done it. GE did it extensively. And again, it's just a short-term focus on profitability. So I want to go to this definition of what is an engineer. This is from the Michigan Tech website. Engineers are expert in their fields, creating and innovating constantly. As practitioners of engineering, engineering professionals deal with complex systems, structures, devices, and materials to fulfill functional requirements while also considering the limitations imposed by regulation, safety, cost, and more. Because of existing limitations, engineering has sometimes been called design under constraint. I thought that's a pretty good definition. And they go on to say, what do engineers do? Engineers solve problems using math, science, and technology. As a problem solver, every potential answer an engineer devises must be weighed against the realities of the physical world and other concerns such as public safety, a client's requirements, regulations, available materials, and a finite budget. It takes creativity to get successfully from problems to solution, all while navigating a tangle of constraints. So I thought that was really good. So hopefully Boeing's going to get their act together. Undoubtedly, there's going to be way more federal oversight from the FAA and other agencies of the federal government to make sure Boeing's doing what they need to be doing to ensure safety of the public. But I'd be interested in what you all think about this situation, and uh, in particular, the, the General Electric angle when it comes to corporate governance. I'd like to send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your support. It enables me to continue producing videos at least once a week. Also like to shout out those of you who have provided super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. Also, if you'd like my free digital download of the top civil engineering disasters of the past 100 years, please check out the link in the description. Thanks very much, everyone.